Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's network talk. It's called The Fact of Blackness, COVID-19 Medical Data and the Racial Design of Public Health, featuring Kenyon Farrell and Tamara K. Knopper. My name is Kelly Owens. I am a health and data researcher here at Data and Society. If you don't know, Data and Society is an independent nonprofit research institute. You can find uh, research from our health and data team in the shared resource guide that we've shared and we'll keep sharing. Uh, and I also want to shout out our affiliate Khadija Ferryman, who I think is on the call and also co-authored the Data and Society report on fairness in precision medicine. I'm about to hand it over to our featured speakers. I first want to briefly note uh, that this uh, event is being recorded. It may be shared afterwards. We have just shared a, a public resource guide where you can also add links, introduce yourself, take note of community agreements. Uh, you'll note that we've changed the format today to a webinar that will help us focus more on Kenyon and Tamara's discussion. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to send us questions. I should also point out that today's event hashtag is hashtag fact of blackness COVID-19. And we'll drop a link into the chat later. Uh, we also sign up for invitations to future Data and Society events. If you are having any tech issues, please message either CJ or Rigo or email events at dataandsociety.net. We are definitely still experimenting with this online format. So we welcome your feedback uh, as well as your patience. So today, uh, we are so glad to connect you with Kenyon Farrow and Tamara K. Knopper. I am going to skip the formal introductions. We will just turn it right over to them. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, first, I just want to thank Data and Society, particularly uh, CJ, Rigo, Audrey, and Rona for um, helping us organize this and all the work involved in it. And thank you, Kelly, for hosting us as um, uh, by, uh, for Data and Society. So uh, first, I just want to um, uh, talk about the title very briefly. The title, Fact of Blackness, comes from Dr. Franz Omar Fanon. And so we're rejecting the idea that there's something biological or genetic um, about race and that there's something biological or genetically determining um, why Black people are disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19, and that should be apparent throughout our conversation. So um, Kenyon, one of the things that, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you, and I just wanna say very quickly, I'm very honored to be able to be in conversation with you about this, is because as we saw a lot of this uh, uh, racial data coming out, and we're seeing this uh, in think pieces, we're seeing it in news reports and social media, we're also seeing a lot of kind of questions about what to do with this data. And as a sociologist, I'm somebody who's very concerned about data literacy. Um, us thinking about um, not only, you know, the numbers that we get or the stories that we get as data as well, but also how that data is collected and the political economy of that data collection, but also how we actually use it and how unfortunately sometimes it's used against us, right? We're seeing that a lot with a lot of these racist interpretations of this medical data that you're seeing more and more black people pushing back against, right? Saying there's nothing specific about black people that's causing them to um, have these high numbers and who uh, trying to draw our attention to the structural aspects of racism. So, um, so we're gonna start today by talking about just some of the basics. And I think this is helpful. Kenny and I talked about how this might be helpful for um, just thinking about us having more of a shared vocabulary around the different institutional players in this pandemic, right? So Kenya, could you first start with explaining why are we hearing uh, Corona and COVID-19, these two different terms? Sure, thank you. So first of all, I want to just say thank you uh, to Data and Society, uh, to all the folks that Tamara just mentioned um, for the invitation to have this conversation. Um, so we're hearing this two different terms, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus, um, kind of used interchangeably in the press. So I'll just explain them uh, very quickly. So um, coronavirus, um, you know, is probably being used because it's kind of easier to type and to describe to people. But actually, um, what we're 
experiencing in this global pandemic is actually COVID-19. And COVID-19 um, is a uh, virus that was essentially named COVID-19. So it's essentially coronavirus 19 because it was discovered in 2019. So that's the kind of name for it. Um, but it belongs to a kind of family of other uh, coronaviruses. Lots of flu viruses are actually in the coronavirus family. SARS, which people may remember, which has been talked about as a sort of cousin of, uh, of what we're experiencing now with COVID-19. They're sort of related uh, viruses um, that probably started um, through uh, kind of contact with, with animals or livestock. People have heard about, you know, bats uh, as, as one particular vector, um, and uh, which often happens that, you know, diseases, viruses, and bacteria sometimes start in, you know, kind of animals and uh, with a, a strain uh, sort of mutation as, you know, viruses and bacteria want to do. Uh, can then become a thing that impacts human beings as well. And there are lots of examples of that. Um, so that's the difference between coronavirus as we sort of hear it and COVID-19. Thank you. Now, we know that there's a lot of conversation about kind of the medical industry and so forth, but can you tell us as an epidemiologist, what is epidemiology specifically? Sure. So uh, epidemiology is basically the study of the distribution of health-related events. and um, Epidemiology is uh, quantitative and often relies on kind of probability and statistics and kind of modeling to determine, uh, you know, kind of how events are sort of happening and the distribution of how they're happening, either across time or across geography. Um, often, so um, you know, it relies on uh, you know kind of testing hypotheses um, around scientific, you know, and using kind of scientific fields such as biology or microbiology physics, um, sometimes just actual geography or physical space um, to explain like either health related, you know, behaviors, uh, states or, or events. Um, and it also, when we, I would say too, when we talk about, uh, you know, infectious disease as it relates to epidemiology, we often hear the term kind of risk factors, right? So we often hear uh, what's a risk factor for COVID-19 or what's a risk factor for HIV, what's a risk factor for um, you know, any number of conditions. Um, and so we use COVID-19 as an example. You know, we've been hearing things like uh, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, as risk factors for um, serious illness and death from COVID-19. Um, and sometimes you hear other things that are, you know, things that we also talk about as sort of more structural pieces like, you know, housing instability or homelessness, um, sometimes age, and sometimes you hear gender or race as correlating to uh, you know, risk factors for certain health conditions. And sometimes you hear about environmental factors. So for one example, um, pe people may have heard of, uh, you know, the sort of stretch of highway on I-10 in, in Louisiana between New Orleans and Baton mm -hmm. Rouge, where there are a lot of uh, oil refineries. Mm -hmm. um, people refer to that um, geography as Cancer Alley because there's an association of um, high rates of cancer in those black communities in Louisiana due to the relationship between mm -hmm. being close to those um, factories, mm -hmm. those refineries that are spewing all kinds of environmental toxins. And so sometimes um, the way epidemiology works, sometimes you may have um, a series of health related kind of events in the case of like, you know, cancer um, in this particular geography. And what epidemiology sometimes will do is look at the cluster of those mm -hmm. health related events. And sometimes the geography is what helps people mm -hmm. determine what the actual sort of, uh, what is the actual cause of a specific kind mm -hmm. of health related illness. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also one way uh, that we see it. Thank you. And as we're gonna talk more about in this conversation, there's obviously debates within epidemiology about how seriously to take, um, to think about racism and what we do with this data yes. when we do see these clusters. We're gonna be talking about that. So we've heard a lot of the Center for Disease Control and the National Institute of Health, um, particularly with Dr. I, I 
how do you pronounce this man's name? Uh, I only Dr. read Fauci. it. Right, I read Fauci. his name. I'm trying to avoid hearing the news since it's just so terrible, but I read his name all the time. So Dr. Fauci, thank you. Can you tell us, as people are demanding national data, right? So there, we've seen this increased demand for data and um, saying, where are the national numbers? And we know that we can go to the CDC and see a lot of national numbers for some of these other things like colds and cold-related deaths, or, or excuse me, flu and flu-related deaths. Can you explain to us the CDC and the National Institute of Health, if you could explain briefly, what is their relationship to the federal government in terms of data collection and dissemination and also kind of um, pandemic planning? Sure, so, um, so I'll talk first about, uh, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, the National Institutes of Health or the NIH, and then also just kind of briefly mention the FDA because that's also in the conversation right now. And they also have a role in terms of, um, you know, race specific or, you know, kind of um, identity specific data collection and analysis. Um, so all three of those agencies are under the umbrella of health and human services or HHS as you uh, will hear about it. And so HHS is sort of the umbrella agency that houses um, basically all public health uh, medical care and most kind of social service or, or kind of entitlement programs um, under HHS. There's a couple exceptions to that rule. So the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA is actually under agriculture. And also when we look at kind of an entitlement program, SNAP or the food stamp program is also under agriculture. But other, all the other sort of programs and agencies are, are under HHS. So specifically, um, the uh, I'll talk about the kind of NIH first. I think thinking about the relationship between mm. the three makes sense this way. So the National Institutes of Health is uh, the umbrella agency for a number of centers that um, do uh, either basic research, uh, what's called often basic science, which is really the sort of understanding microbiology or virology, the sort of microorganisms um, that cause uh, disease or allergies or infectious disease. Um, and sometimes cancer as well, you know, cancers as well. So it can be things that are more chronic conditions or, or that are non-communicable diseases that they study. But they study basic science um, and uh, also the sort of uh, uh, biomedical research that is looking for uh, causation, uh, cures, and vaccines to different um, health-related conditions. Um, and so the NIH is different centers. Now, you mentioned um, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Well, a lot of people think is the head of the National Institutes of Health. He's not. Mm -hmm. He's the head of the National mm -hmm. Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, mm -hmm. which is a division within uh, mm -hmm. NIH, is one of the centers. And mm -hmm. so that particular center focuses on infectious disease and, and allergens, which is why he's so visible in the mm -hmm. kind of COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. uh, conversation. But a lot of people think he's the head of the NIH and mm -hmm. he's not. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one piece about uh, the NIH. I'll also, well, I'll also mention for the NIH, I think it's also important to know, because in this conversation, we'll get to some issues around sort of conspiracy theory and medical mistrust. I think when I talk to a lot of folks and they hear about, you know, vaccine cures or treatments being developed and, you know, especially working on HIV, as I do a lot, the question that I hear a lot of, don't you think that they got the cure already and there's more money in the treating people than there is in the cure. And that may make some sense, you know, in a certain way, but that's actually not really how it works. The National Institutes of Health really funds a lot of academic institutions. So mm. if you are, so if you, you know, went to a university or your grad student or whatever, you know, a school that has like a large kind of, you know, in health institute or research institutes, um, that also that study, uh, you know, diseases and conditions, those are all funded largely by NIH, which is just to say taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And most kind of development of, of vaccine cure research uh, happens at public universities, at, at mm. those funded institutions. Mm -hmm. Actually, far fewer um, of those things are discovered in and of themselves at uh, pharmaceutical companies, right? Mm -hmm. What often happens is, you know, NIH will fund the initial research and once uh, a, a particular product or whatever looks good, a pharma company may then come in and help mm -hmm. develop it. And so then they get the patent for it, mm -hmm. right? So this is how the, the sort of relationship. So, um, so, so just to say like they, they fund a lot of the public research in that way. Could you um, just, I'm sorry, so, real quickly, could you just tell us um, before we get to Dr. Jerome Adams, the Surgeon yeah. General, can you just tell us like, 
where does the CDC get this data? Is it something that's collected at the state level or do they sure. collect it on the federal level? Yeah, so when we're talking about the C, so is the NIH, when we're talking about the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a different agency under HHS, which basically um, they take, they are the sort of epidemiologists where they're studying, um, doing research around causation of illness and also research and also implementing programs of what we often call in public health interventions, mm -hmm. of different strategies that we know or we hope will reduce uh, you know, illness mm -hmm. or uh, infection or et cetera in a, in a number of different, or, or, or any kind of um, uh, health related events. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be just infectious disease. Um, so that's um, sort of the CDC's role. Um, and they also have different branches and divisions. Now, where does CDC get uh, its uh, kind of data from around, um, you know, so when you see CDC reports that talk about, you know, uh, racial disparities or, you know, gay and bisexual men or trans women and, you know, pick a condition or whatever, or sometimes regional, the South versus the Midwest or state. Um, so part of what happens is the CDC, um, they get the data from a couple of different sources. One of the major sources is actually from, um, from city and state health departments. So um, there's a direct relationship between, uh, particularly in infectious disease, uh, the ways in which uh, public health departments are required to report certain health, what's called a, a reportable health condition, to uh, the to the CDC, so they can mm -hmm. understand, uh, you know, kind of what's what's going on, the epidemiology of a, of a situation. So, um, oftentimes, uh, race data uh, or kind of being able to determine sort of racial impact um, can come from a couple of different sources in that. So. Uh, when you go to the hospital or if you go to your local STD clinic, right, and get treated or you go to another place, you know, you fill out information, right, mm -hmm. usually, which, yeah. you know, your name, address, your insurance, mm -hmm. and they ask you, you know, your family, health history, you know, race, age, all those things. So those things get collected in your, um, you know, just kind of health records. Now, when it comes to things that then get reported to public health departments, if you're not at a health department when you um, go to get seen and get picked up by the CDC, they have disaggregated that from your particular, your, like your name or your personal mm -hmm. information, but mm -hmm. the, the uh, dem other demographical information mm -hmm. uh, is collected. So it will mm -hmm. be your age, your race, uh, if there are particular risk factors, um, associated that you have a, a history of, a family history of, or et cetera. And so that's part of how race uh, data gets collected. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that it's also not, um, I mean, that's, that's what happens in, in, in one set of scenarios. Sometimes in situations like what's happening with COVID-19, where you're having so many people die rapidly, some of the ways in which the race, the data around race is being collected uh, can be from whatever the, you know, the, the forms or medical data that was filled out when the person came in to be seen or what exists, you know, because the person had already been seen in a, in a health mm -hmm. system because that's where their primary mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. is or whatever, or an emergency room. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, oh, I just got a request to slow down a bit. Sorry, it's a lot of information I'm trying to cover, so I'll try to slow down. Um, so, uh, so that's one way that the health data gets, the race data gets collected. Another way it gets collected and, and what we've seen happen and what some jurisdictions have reported in the coronavirus and why it's taken so long to get um, race health data is, uh, you know, people are coming in and then dying. And so some of it is then people having to go back and, and kind of input information kind of after the fact because mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. such a crisis and mm -hmm. such a, uh, a, a dearth of, of healthcare providers and resources or whatever to take care of folks. Mm -hmm. So some of that initial, you know, pre-screening and triage and things that you're used to in an emergency room may not be happening, right? Because of just the volume mm -hmm. of people that folks are seeing. So those are some of the ways that, uh, you know, it's, and some of it is self-report as well. Thank you. And we're going to expand upon that when we talk about kind of some of the local data reports that are coming out in a moment. Um, and we'll get to your point about the FDA significance when we start talking about global anti-blackness and the supply chain, right, yes. around um, uh, how we're uh, able to kind of deal with the pandemic. But um, so let's talk about Dr. Jerome Adams. This is sure. the nation's Surgeon General, and Surgeon Generals are known as, quote unquote, the nation's doctor 
right? Yeah. Um, I think anytime we see a person of color in you know this administration, it's always politically useful for us to ask, you know, whose man's is this, right? You know, right. and so can you tell us about who Dr. Jerome Adams is and his relationship to Vice President Pence? Sure. So uh, Dr. Jerome Adams, the current Surgeon General, uh, is from Indiana and was the uh, director of the Indiana uh, State Health Department when Mike Pence was governor of the state of Indiana. Now, I should also mention that uh, Jerome Adams is not a public health specialist, right? He's not uh, an MD with an infectious disease specialty. He's an anesthesiologist, right? Um, which, you know, just <laughs> makes you wonder about just even being the head of the state health department with an anesthesiology specialty and not a public health one um, is a question we should be asking. So that's number one. Number two, um, part of how Jerome- I'm sorry, Adams I'm just having such a strong <laughs> reaction. I'm just like, yeah. I looked at his bio, but good Lord. Yeah, okay, a, go ahead, he's sorry. An he's an anesthesiologist. <clears throat> so, uh, Part of how Jerome Adams became uh, kind of infamous, if you will, before uh, he became the Surgeon General was uh, in 2014. So Jerome Adams was appointed to uh, head of the state, Indiana State Health Department in, uh, I think, October of 2014. In November of 2014, we started to notice that there was a cluster of uh, new, newly diagnosed people living with HIV in a very small, mostly white rural county called Scott County in the state of Indiana. And, uh, and that number ended up creeping up, I think, to about 150 people uh, diagnosed with HIV in a matter of a few months. Um, out of a county that only has about 20,000 people, right? So it's yeah. a pretty high infection mm -hmm. rate for a, a very small county. And um, upon subsequent looking, we realized that the county had been particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic. And so a lot of, you know, the transmission was through people sharing, um, you know, needles to inject drugs. Um, but when you, so that's kind of one crisis in and of itself, right? So when you then go back and kind of look at what happened with Scott County, Indiana, the county had really one major sort of health facility in the county, and that was Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And Mike Pence was uh, behind a bill in the state of Indiana to uh, defund Planned Parenthood, so the state would not provide funding for Planned Parenthood. And so in a couple of years, that that uh, Planned Parenthood closed. Mm. So anyone mm. who's been to Planned Parenthood knows that you can get free mm. HIV and STI mm. screening at mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood. And so there was no real um, kind of healthcare facility in mm -hmm. the county. Um, and so it took a long time for the HIV, mm -hmm. it took longer than it probably need to for mm -hmm. the uh, HIV, uh, new HIV diagnoses uh, to be discovered. Um, because there was no health provider, because mm. of some, mm -hmm. you know anti-abortion politics in the state, and uh, what happened with Jerome Adams was a lot of uh, activists, both in the state and a lot of people nationally who are AIDS activists, started paying attention to this and demanding that the state uh, now open syringe exchange programs mm -hmm. uh, and use state funding to fund those programs in the state, including in Scott County. And initially, Jerome Adams was very reticent to do it. He eventually came around uh, at, through some public pressure and, uh, and, and then supported mm -hmm. uh, expanding syringe access in uh, Scott County and the rest of the state. But I think that what we can say about uh, Jerome Adams in that context and looking at where he is now and kind of some of the things that he said recently is, mm -hmm. I don't have particular evidence for this, but I believe it to be true that in given who Mike Pence is and just kind of some of the things I picked up from him, that he's probably a right wing evangelical, right? Even mm -hmm. as a black man or whatever. And that is their sort of common relationship mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. Mike Pence is a, is a right wing evangelical. And, um, and so that kind of fuels and, and kind of helps us understand kind of who he is and how he sees, uh, you know, his role and probably has impacted some of the things in which he's, you know, kind of been uh, mm -hmm. the mouthpiece for saying things about, you know, uh, Black people need to quit smoking and watch our diet, mm -hmm. these sort of things, and we won't get coronavirus mm -hmm. as, as a, somehow some kind of solution. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and it helps us just understand, as you were saying, you know, how do you even get in this official position as the Surgeon General, so right. especially during a pandemic. So right. um, thank you. So we're going to switch uh, to talking about kind of local data. So we're starting to see a lot of this local data being reported. Um, and you were talking about just some of the different ways uh, the data is collected locally and what this means in terms of then what gets compiled federally, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's something like the CDC. But one of the questions, you know, when we're thinking about this data is, so we know that there are a lot of people who um, are also vulnerable to COVID-19 and are dying from COVID-19 or getting infected um, who are uh, in captivity, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, um, Survive and Punish, which is a national organization that's been calling on uh, Governor Cuomo in New York um, uh, to get clemency, right? That's been an ongoing campaign but um, calls for clemency have become kind of more urgent um, for groups like Survive and Punish or for organizations like RAP, uh, Release Aging People in Prison campaign, mm -hmm. right? Um, as this pandemic is spreading. So when we're getting these local reports, does that include people who are in captivity? Who might be, held, who might be hidden in this data, right? Sure. Yeah, so there's, uh, so the numbers of, of, of deaths that we are now uh, at, and even just the numbers of people tested that we're at are, are um, some level of undercounts of the people who are actually uh, living with coronavirus and people who may in fact have died from coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, and part, and so, yes, there are folks in uh, prison and in jails uh, in detention centers, et cetera, whom um, may in fact have coronavirus and may in fact be dying and not uh, be counted in that. So, and there are several reasons for that. Some of which is, if we're talking specifically about um, conditions of like sort of carceral confinement, prisons, jails, detention centers, et cetera, there's uh, generally terrible health care. And so people have to then you know, request to be seen by a physician, et cetera. That may take days or weeks or what have you um, before. And so people may in fact be very sick and either get better or die before they see a physician, right? Um, and so that's sort of one problem. The other problem is when we're talking about kind of counting in data, um, you know, counting the, the uh, cause of death, right, is uh, not a straightforward sort of, you know, thing as people may assume. So, you know, there are ways and, and reasons in which people may in fact be uh, counted in this particular case as dying of respiratory failure or mm -hmm. organ failure, right? Mm -hmm. Massive organ failure, uh, some of the other kind of late stage uh, kind of uh, causes of death when it might actually be sort of coronavirus that's happening because they were never tested in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So that, that mm -hmm. may be, or cause of death unknown, right? So that, that may be um, at, at play in some of the, the reasons, mm -hmm. or, you know, I don't have any specific evidence of this happening right now, but, but you know, there are certainly instances of this where people intentionally don't and leave off the real causes of people dying because mm -hmm. then it requires kind of additional scrutiny. It may require mm -hmm. them to spend part of their budget on healthcare mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, other sort of things, especially mm -hmm. in an infectious disease situation mm -hmm. where you have to act quickly and use a lot of resources to sort of protect people mm -hmm. and be able to take care of folks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, and sometimes out of stigma, right? So I know from the, you know, kind of history of the AIDS epidemic where, um, you know, people would be listed as having died from cancer or from pneumonia. Or, or from a cold. Or from yeah. a cold, right. Yeah. And, you know, these sorts of things that get kind of written down when, you know, it's really, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the bigger sort of issue mm -hmm. was, you know, in, in that case, the kind of a, the HIV uh, that was, uh, that, that was the real reason they died, mm -hmm. but they disguised it by, you know, putting mm -hmm. it as like, you know, whatever the opportunistic infection that mm -hmm. may have like mm -hmm. been the final sort of blow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now going to, real quickly to the issue of testing, because we're hearing all this stuff about, you know, there's not enough testing. There's been a lot of serious concerns about people with more class resources or racial privilege getting access to testing. So how do we put in perspective um, some of these critiques around who's getting access to testing and then also these disproportionate racial numbers, 
right? In terms yeah. of uh, infections themselves. Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think that, you know, so as folks are probably aware, there's a lot of focus right now in the last, you know, week or two about um, the disproportionate impact of, of COVID-19, um, particularly on Black people in the United States. And so there have been, you know, some, because the CDC hasn't necessarily even been able to collect that data from all the jurisdictions, they haven't put out any data, but local jurisdictions have in some cases put out some data showing, you know, in Louisiana, 70% of the people who have died have been uh, Black folks. A disproportionate number of, uh, of Black men uh, in Milwaukee, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some places that have, have put that, New York City has put, put that data out as well. Um, so, uh, but, but one of the, the sort of challenges, I think, to where we are in the, the kind of activist discourse of this is to me, a lot of the kind of think pieces and all the kind of calls to, in some think pieces and major publications, for, to be frank, or whatever, um, to me, get kind of stuck at this like, you know, spectacle of the disproportionate rates of Black people dying and, uh, you know, and then calling for more uh, kind of data around the disproportionate rates. But I think it's a mistake, unfortunately, to kind of stop there. And, and I'll say that, like, frankly, for a lot of organizations that are putting on webinars about coronavirus and they don't have actual epidemiologists or people who are experts in uh, infectious disease or, or MDs or nurse practitioners who work in that field, Black wants to be able to speak to some of these things. So that the, so the sort of activism and the calls are just stuck at like requests for data and not about really the things that we need to do to sort of stop the epidemic, right? So, um, so, so that's sort of one piece. So then it just becomes like, you know, let's, uh, you know, get the data and also people who aren't sophisticated about like how different data sets can be used in ways that they may not understand what they're calling for. Mm -hmm. So in that particular case, um, you know, so yes, we're seeing this disproportionate impact happen to, to black communities. And at the same time, we're also beginning to see in which the response to coronavirus in some jurisdictions is turning into a kind of police surveil mm -hmm. discipline and punish approach. Mm -hmm. So therefore we're seeing in some jurisdictions, so first of all, you had the, uh, the uh, head of the Justice Department uh, a couple weeks ago put out guidance to mm -hmm. states and say, you know, if you have people who are quote unquote intentionally spreading coronavirus, right. which what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, then you can use anti-terrorism statutes on yeah. your books to go after those mm -hmm. people. So that's one. The second thing is um, other jurisdictions are, you know, arresting people. So first of all, it, the kind of call for everybody to wear masks, and then you see Black people being arrested for wearing masks in grocery stores, mm -hmm. right? Uh, right. And I think just very quickly, like um, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, um, uh, she put together a presentation recently mm -hmm. called um, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, kind of raising these very questions. And, you, right. and for those who are interested, uh, she tweeted the presentation. So you can go to Dr. Ruha Benjamin's Twitter um, or Facebook to find that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so you have some of those, that kind of dynamic in terms of the like sort of, you know, uh, policing and, and surveillance state, but then you, you have ways in which that data can be used for things that we don't, you know, yet, that, you know, uh, companies that are beginning to kind of like, you know, build a, or think about a range of like uh, surveillance technology so that yeah. like you have to get a test before you leave your house. And so if we're looking at epidemiology, again, as the distribution of, of a state of health or illness, then the kinds of resources, if we're not clear about what our kind of calls are, uh, will inadvertently put calls for more policing in those communities where we're seeing more yeah. of the epidemic as opposed to the things that will actually uh, kind of avert new yeah. transmissions moving forward and helping people who are already sick. And I think this goes to your point about having more um, Black public health experts and people who've been doing this work for a long time being part of these conversations because as you're suggesting, if I'm understanding what you're, you're, um, you're suggesting here is that we can demand more data 
but a lot of different institutions would also like to use this data, whether it's for tracking people or surveillance mm -hmm. or, you know, pharmaceutical company, whatever, right, who want to claim that there's something that is discovered in this data. And so part of it is, you know, thinking about your work as a communications expert, I know you have a master's in journalism with a specific focus on health reporting, right? right. And you've done a lot of communications work. Um, this is also what you're doing um, uh, as the senior editor of The Body. And, you know, so it's also about, I think, um, how do people who care about uh, Black life and who care about Black health also uh, politically approach the narratives regarding the data, right? So it's both kind of demanding data, but also, you know, shaping the narratives about the use of that data. Because we're seeing, unfortunately, again, all these racist ways it's being used against Black people, right? right, right. And one of my concerns is just the way that um, people, you know, you heard about the white doctor who strangled the black girl, right? Mm -hmm. Because she wasn't socially distancing. So you have mm -hmm. not only the police, but you have white vigilantes right. who are enacting these, you know, uh, racist um, violence um, and they're claiming it's for the public health, right? right. And, and for the, and so forth. So I think that's a very important point that you're raising about kind of what is the narrative around this data. Now, very, very quickly before we get to, um, uh, uh, a couple of other points. Can we talk about how to think about Latinos in this conversation in relationship mm -hmm. to Black people, right? Sure. Um, you know, depending on how the race data is collected, right, Latino in the federal government sense in the census is understood as an ethnicity and you can be of any race. We know a lot of Latinos um, self-identify as non-black even if they might be Afro-Latinos or black. So they might either just pick, you know, a range of other groups like white or other, right? right. So how do we make sense of when we're hearing these reports like in a city like New York, right? Latinos right. having the highest. Is that an undercount of black people in some cases? Yeah, thank you for raising that because that was when I saw the New York City data um, showing uh, that like, you know, Latinos or Latinx folks are uh, the kind of most disproportionately impacted by uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, illness and deaths. Um, I it just was like, okay, well, this is New York City, where a large portion of people uh, who are uh, Latino uh, are from the Caribbean, you know, so are from uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and um, we still have a lot of Cubans in New York City, which people sort of forget um, in, in New York and New Jersey. Um, and so to me, when we look at Latino data, I think especially depending on the jurisdiction we have, to, so I think pretty much up and down the East Coast and in Florida, we have to really raise questions about whether or not that is an undercount. And one of the things in my kind of, you know, HIV work over the years, I often will ask the CDC for when they present uh, data about Latinos to also present um, kind of country of origin. Mm -hmm. If there's now obviously, mm -hmm. you know, Puerto Rico, you know, depending on, you know, but Puerto Rico independence and also, but, you know, or as a commonwealth of the United States, but, but even to, to know that, um, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to just Latino as a, as a mm -hmm. broad frame can then give us more data, at least about kind of, you know, where country of origin, if we can't get race specific data, will at least mm -hmm. give us a little bit more proximity mm -hmm. to populations of Latinx folks who are like uh, more likely to be Black. Okay, thank you. Now, before we go to kind of globalization, the global supply chain, um, one of the things that I want us to also think about is when we're talking about kind of anti-Blackness, there's this way where sometimes people will say like, oh, we're going to think about how it specifically affects Black people, which is obviously the most important conversation. But how does anti-Blackness shape the kind of entire infrastructure of kind of um, healthcare and in terms of what medical kind of institutions are even available to us in this pandemic, right? So regardless of kind of, um, you know, the race, right? Um, when we're dealing with kind of, you know, limited number of hospital beds, when we're dealing with kind of public versus private or issues around health insurance, right? Mm -hmm. How does anti-Blackness structure just kind of what we're what we have available as resources right now in terms of medical care. Yeah. So I mean, I think for the last uh, certainly 50 years, the right wing has used um, has racialized 
social safety net and entitlement programs, right, writ large. Mm -hmm. So everything from, uh, you know, kind of Ronald Reagan sort of frame of welfare queens through, you know, the 1980s and the Welfare Reform Act, which basically did the same thing. They have, they've been very successful with very little pushback, frankly, from many so-called Democrats or whatever, um, from kind of putting forth two sort of narratives. One is that uh, corporations are much more efficient at, you know, doing things uh, and that the federal government should not be involved in first as a, as a frame. And the other frame is that, um, you know, people are, you know, undeserving of just getting on public benefits of whatever mm -hmm. sort, including health care. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and, and you shouldn't be willing to spend your taxpayer dollar on people who won't get up and work for their quote unquote health care, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's so, because that has like animated so many discussions about like the kind of social safety net in this country, the debate and what we ended up getting with the Affordable Care Act reflected that. So mm -hmm. the fact that like, you know, they, the Democrats in that discussion initially floated a sort of public option, but further reporting sort of showed Nancy Pelosi would have had long taken that off the table behind the scenes with not only Republicans, but with the pharmaceutical industry and with the insurance industry who also helped write that mm -hmm. bill. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was just kind of a public ruse to make like a sort of like single payer folks shut up, mm -hmm. but they weren't ever really going to push that. That's number one. What they did give us was this sort of you know, public private sort of dynamic where, you know, it was if you have, you know, uh, healthcare insurance through your job, you'll keep it that private insurance. Secondly, uh, you know, if you are poor enough to get Medicaid, you can, the state will expand Medicaid, et cetera. Um, and then people, you know, in the middle can get their private insurance to the exchanges. So that was like the structure. And what ended up happening was the, you know, Republican states sued the government um, after the bill was passed in 2010. And in 2013, the Supreme Court took up two cases and ruled on the Affordable Care Act. First, a case that they took up um, in the, in the uh, legal fight was um, about the uh, individual mandate to, to have to have health insurance, right? The Supreme Court decided that that was okay, right? And if you think about it, that was about private insurance. And so mm -hmm. like the idea that people had to have private insurance that they paid for out of pocket mm -hmm. uh, with some subsidies, mm -hmm. but basically out of pocket, that's okay. But making the states actually uh, take what was basically 100% funding or 95% funding of their Medicaid program and expand it, you know, um, that that was a, a reach too far and basically uh, call that part unconstitutional. And mm -hmm. I remember when it happened, I literally, I cried because I knew what the impact was going to be. The Southern states, which were not going to expand, which is where we see the kind of the most numbers of people living with HIV who uh, are uninsured live in those states. Um, and where we just see the general kind of greatest like racial health disparities, right? Mm -hmm. And frankly, not a lot of uh, so-called progressives or radicals did or said much about it, if, mm -hmm. if I'm being very honest. And, um, and so that has colored like how we now is where there's a debate about, you know, Medicare for all or whatever, but it's very much colored by a racialized notion mm -hmm. about like socialized medicine, which is often to say that, yeah. you know, there are these people who are on welfare and getting something free yeah. that you shouldn't pay for, right? And that's, the, yeah. that's where we are. I mean, I think, you know, going to your point is that if we want Medicare for all, we're going to have to, you know, deal with the fact that anti-Blackness is a major factor right. in impeding us from being able to get it, right? Right. Um, now, quickly, how did this affect hospital closures, right? The Affordable Care Act. So... Um, and the resistance, excuse me, to the Affordable sure. Care Act. Yeah, so, so what happened was uh, the federal government paid for some level of uncompensated care to hospitals. So it was a way that the federal government, if, if uh, hospitals saw uninsured people, that they could be reimbursed, you know, um, you know, through from federal government monies provided to the states. The Affordable Care Act was written to basically, once you expanded Medicaid, you could actually get rid of the uncompensated care um, sort of funding because most people would, ha would have some kind of insurance. But when you gutted the Medicaid expansion, 
states then um, didn't have, so you had a lot of hospitals and there are people who I spoke to who were hospital administrators in, in different states around that time who um, said, you know, we had already were beginning to budget what our, you know, kind of financial forecast would look like based on most of the care we're now seeing, people would have Medicaid or some form of health insurance to be covered. And then when their states didn't expand Medicaid, they were frankly just asked out. So, so then you start to see hospitals close because either they were just, you know, cash short of being able to care for people and had already budgeted there, had done their sort of budget projections, mm -hmm. thinking that there would be more coverage of insurance and that didn't happen. So that was a huge part of like why that there's so many particularly rural hospitals um, mm -hmm. closed in the last, mm -hmm. uh, you know, roughly mm -hmm. like five to 10 years. Thank you. Now, let's go global here. So if we're thinking about anti-Blackness, it's also on a global level, how does it shape kind of the supply chains? Because right now we're hearing about, you know, mask, um, test, uh, even things like, you know, where will we get our hand sanitizer, factories and output and so forth. And China is obviously getting a lot of attention in this conversation about kind of globalization supply chains, partly because of the president's uh, racist rhetoric, but also because of, you know, where the outbreak first happened, right? Mm -hmm. But how does anti-Blackness shape kind of this conversation about global supply chains? And I think this is also where um, we can return back to your point about the Food and Drug Administration and the right. FDA's role in um, a kind of pandemic uh, a crisis work, right. so. Yeah, so one of the ways that uh, I think anti-Blackness shapes, like when we look at kind of global uh, health and, and global epidemics and, and supply <laughs> chains, so um, one way is that, um, so first of all, the you know, as FDA, Food and Drug Administration, their role within HHS is to approve um, you know, on the drug side and medical devices to look at the research that's submitted by pharmaceutical companies often. They submit new drug applications um, to get approved for a drug to you know, be used for whatever sort of condition. Now, and the FDA can um, you know, approve those, they sometimes reject applications, et cetera, right? Um, and a recent example is they, re they rejected an application from Gilead Sciences for a Discovy, which is a new, uh, or, or a drug uh, that's been used for part of HIV therapy, but that particular drug also works for HIV prevention. Um, but because they didn't do any studies with cisgender women, the FDA said, we can't approve this drug for cisgender women until you come back with, with the research to prove it, right? So FDA makes those kind of determinations. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the kind of globally what's happening uh, and what may happen in terms of like the, the kind of emergency preparedness and response. Um, and where drugs are made, right, I think has a big part of how we think about anti-Blackness in this scenario. So it's probably a surprise to know people that, to, not a surprise to most people that, you know, um, uh, vast majority of people living with HIV around the globe live in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, 20 years ago when uh, there was uh, new, the sort of new antiretroviral drugs that were on the market, well, 25 years ago. And then as uh, companies and, and activists and NGOs were beginning to look at how do we sort of distribute these drugs kind of evenly across the globe so that people in poor countries could access them because they were very expensive in the United States. Um, some discussions about, well, how do we get pharma companies to uh, kind of give up their uh, kind of patent licensing to a generic drug maker mm -hmm. who could make these drugs for cheap, uh, you know, for the global market. Now, there are a lot of activists uh, in Africa who, you know, in some country leaderships, ministries of health and presidents who said, um, why don't you give us, like, we can build the capacity to actually be able to manufacture these drugs in our countries. We would not only go a long way to uh, treating people with HIV um, in a cost-effective way, but will also kind of create an economy, right? It'll, it'll mm -hmm. add to our economy, it'll add jobs, et cetera. Most countries, with the exception of South Africa, were denied the possibility of doing so. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what happens when you look at like the global supply chain of a lot of drugs that are created for infectious disease, they're made in China or in India and some in South Africa. But basically, um, those two places, and so you still have a situation where 
the brunt of many of these sort of pandemics land in Africa, mm -hmm. but they are not able to produce those drugs in those places. And I would mm -hmm. be remiss if I didn't say that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the you know, Clinton Global mm -hmm. uh, AIDS Initiative play major roles in actually stopping uh, those African mm -hmm. countries from being able to do that kind of development. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so that is kind of how we see it play mm -hmm. out on a, on a macro global level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, I want to go to this point about the national stockpile, because I know that some of your work, you were the policy director, um, one of the, uh, you, what was your full title at uh, Treatment Action Group? I'm yeah. sorry. So I was the U.S. and Global Health Policy Director. Okay, so Treatment Action Group, which was a global health organization, and it was from your work with them that I learned, I didn't realize that tuberculosis, for example, is uh, returned as one of the top, um, you know, causes of death worldwide, particularly in Southeast Asia and in Africa, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you did when you worked with Treatment Action Group, TAG, is you talked about and you wrote a report on national stockpile. So we're hearing a lot about kind of what is a national stockpile in the midst of pandemic. So could you please tell us kind of what is a national stockpile and then kind of how do we understand, um, you know, some of the factors you were just talking about in relationship to the stockpile today? Sure. So um, part of what I did when I was at TAG was we were dealing with a situation in the United States where, um, you know, people who contracted uh, tuberculosis or TB were sometimes coming up with uh, a shortage of drugs to, to be able to take. And this is what happens when you have, a, you know, kind of healthcare and a capitalist system. Because we don't have a lot of TB in the United States, there's a lot globally, but because there's not a lot of TB in the United States and we're reliant on uh, private corporations to manufacture drugs, um, there's only one manufacturer for some of the major like first line treatments for tuberculosis, antibiotics. So, um, so we would have drug shortages in the United States and there's no national uh, entity that tracks uh, drug supply for infectious diseases in the United States. Mm. The irony of it all is that the U.S. pays for uh, an entity called the Global Drug Facility, which is in Geneva, Switzerland, um, and we pay for uh, basically that institution to track um, TB drugs for, uh, and actually they do packaging and they, they negotiate cheap prices and manufacturing to be able to then uh, send those drugs to countries, um, you know, at cheap rates, right? So we had access, so we pay for that, but because a lot of those manufacturers are not manufactured to, are not uh, approved to produce drugs in the United States because there's no financial benefit mm -hmm. for them doing so with such low TB rates, um, we would have shortages. Mm -hmm. So one of the strategies that we worked on that was successful was to get the U.S., the CDC does have with another um, agency, a global stockpile of, of flu vaccine, of uh, anthrax, <laughs> uh, you know, treatment and, you know, things like that for emergency preparedness. And so what we're hearing now is people begin to think about like the stockpile and kind of when we're talking about like personal protective equipment and other things that they carry in the stockpile and realizing that, um, that first of all, I think with the current administration, those things have just been greatly defunded. So there's like really fewer people who are in control of that stuff. But also that because we live in such a, uh, you know, with uh, just obviously like kind of capitalism and sort of markets running our healthcare system, then you have a situation where there's less of those things. And it also states end up competing with each other for, you know, goods and services for healthcare, which is what we're seeing now mm. with coronavirus. Thank you. So I think Kelly, um, we're going to conclude, uh, we're going to take a couple of questions. I think Kelly is going to um, give us a couple of questions for Kenyon to answer. And then we're going to conclude with kind of what do we do with this data, right? And kind of how do we think about the long term uh, trajectory towards um, uh, protecting and defending black health. So. Sure. sure. Thank you guys both so much to Kenyon and Tamara. Uh, we've had a bunch of questions. I'm sure we won't have a chance to get through all of them, unfortunately, but here is a great one. What are some strategies to get race and ethnicity data from municipalities into the hands of communities of color? Well, again, I think that, um, you know, that work is, is happening. I mean, I think that there, there are, you know, activists, to, you know, asking for their state and local health departments 
to share that data, especially around coronavirus. They collect that data for other kinds of conditions already, but this is a specific situation. So I think, um, one, it's, it's really kind of pressing on your local public health authorities for it. Um, and secondly, again, I think that it's a, to me, it, the, the, the sort of demand for data, that demographic race or whatever, needs to be coupled with an actual kind of analysis of what you want them to do with that data, right? So is it that you want to understand that data so then they will increase uh, testing is now sort of coronavirus testing is beginning to roll out where that testing should go, making sure people have access to treatment once, you know, vaccine and treatments become available, et cetera, uh, making sure that the uh, people who are caring for people with coronavirus in the local public hospitals or, or clinics or whatever have access to enough equipment because they're seeing more people. It's to me, we have to start to think about those kinds of things as opposed to just kind of writ large demands for data without any other kind of demand that results in material benefits for people because that data can, like I said, be demand and then be used for, for other kinds of, 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 uh, of things. Yeah, um, thank you. Seeing what time it is, I'm going to uh, wrap things up and then give you guys uh, some final closing, the time for some closing remarks. Uh, so I just want to say to everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to Kenyon and Tamara for this discussion, which is incredibly important. Uh, I would just want to reference that you should check out our calls to action in the resource guide that we have linked. Uh, there are a lot of requests also for Dr. Ruha Benjamin's talk. That is also in our resource guide. Please also add your own suggestions. Reach out with any feedback that you might have. Uh, you can see future data and society talks on our website. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kenyon and Tamara for some wrap up. Thanks. Guys. Thank you. So Kenyon, you know, wrapping up you, uh, the one question that you addressed, um, uh, was asking about kind of what do we do with some of this data and so forth. Yeah. But, you know, one of your major areas of, of work is thinking about kind of medical misinformation campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the themes that we've looked at was the way that people can use this data against us, right? right. Um, one of the things to kind of think about I, that your medical misinformation looks at is you've looked at specifically how have Black people often been targeted with medical misinformation mm -hmm. and how um, are some of these medical misinformation campaigns, whether they're kind of grassroots or through kind of just everyday conversations or through kind of pop culture, um, a lot of times they're, they're acknowledging that racism is happening, right? right? And they're acknowledging that black people have been mistreated and violated by the medical industry, right? And so one of the questions is, is that as we're thinking about, um, uh, you know, um, racial justice and the intersection with um, health justice, right? Mm -hmm. How would you respond to kind of these concerns uh, about, you know, this long history of what uh, people like um, Harriet Washington have called medical apartheid. And where does kind of, how do Black people fighting and, and allies uh, fighting for uh, Black health justice, mm -hmm. how do we kind of uh, approach this issue? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, this is like where a lot of my passion is coming together. I think that First of all, um, you, you know, when people, I hear a lot now of people referencing uh, Harry Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, um, in ways to sort of talk, kind of use it as a catchphrase to reference, you know, medical mistrust that Black people have after years of racist medical experimentation and a range of things. Um, and often people refer directly to the Tuskegee syphilis study as the kind of, you know, primary grounding for that understanding. Um, and I think it's important, obviously, to acknowledge like that history of like racial violence through medicine and public health, right? I think that's in, in uh, clinical research. That is that is clear. But I think what people often then kind of like miss is actually the ways in which um, access to care and treatment and even access sometimes to actual clinical trials is actually a racial justice issue. So when people kind of reference the Tuskegee syphilis experiment to me, they think about the part of the experiment that was about the uh, lack of consent to participate in a clinical mm -hmm. trial and into, you know, and that people kind of died from syphilis. But what people don't often talk about is the fact that like 10 years into the experiment, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, penicillin was discovered mm -hmm. like uh, to cure syphilis and was all and was a, a, a standard of care and that they kept those men from the yeah. that particular uh, from penicillin right mm -hmm. for another like uh, 40 or 30 years yeah so I think that I am often stressing to people like there is racism in the system let's point to where it really is but if you are believing that somebody out here used alkaline water and you know a diet to cure people of HIV or other kinds of infectious diseases, like that actually doesn't benefit us. And secondly, I think that with some of the conspiracy theories, while I understand they address racism, part of what they do is actually to me, it are formulated from some level of white supremacy because they mm -hmm. suggest that, you know, the kind of white man or woman through the state, right? is omniscient and knows everything. So therefore, any infectious disease or pandemic that happens must be man-made and must be, you know, kind of a thing, which to me actually gives power away mm -hmm. from us to being able to kind of actively respond and actually begin to actually demand that uh, we have access to care. So I'm just going to close on this last point. So what I think that we need to do is this, and this is for folks who work in kind of social justice spaces, who frankly to me are are sometimes the most kind of conspiratorial in terms of health conditions and actually involve people who do this work the least. So I would say like, first of all, we need more kind of work to kind of demystify these systems to people so people understand what clinical and biomedical research is, what public health is, what healthcare systems are, how they're supposed to work, et cetera, what legal rights they have, blah, blah, blah. Also, we have to acknowledge that racism exists, but we also have to talk about access to health care as it exists as a racial justice issue, right? Including Medicare for all or whatever. Um, and so I, and I think that we need more sort of campaigns and projects that actually help mobilize people around places where they see medical mistreatment happening in order to get better access to care. And then lastly, we have to involve like black folks who do this work. So like there should be, if you're again, doing uh, events around health issues, COVID or whatever, involve like HIV activists who often understand public health infrastructures, mm -hmm. involve like, you know, infectious disease doctors and nurses, the black people who are virologists who I know, who do all this sort of work, um, who also need to be kind of in these conversations as well. So thank you, Kenny. Uh, would you mind just sharing with us some of the names of people or organizations here in the United States or globally that in terms of some of the work um, so that way we can get a better handle on who should be invited to participate in these conversations? Um, sure. So uh, up front, there's um, kind of on the global level, one of my uh, treatment access campaign in South Africa is an organization that does a lot of work in the country. Uh, here in the United States, um, there's a Black AIDS Institute. There's I mean, a lot of Black HIV organizations are, are doing this work. There's, um, it, you should follow uh, Uchi Blackstock, uh, who's a, a, a doctor who's uh, doing a lot of great work and is now actually being one of the Black people who's able to talk about this on, on is being picked up on television and mainstream mm -hmm. press. Um, there's also, I would read, and I would really read Harriet Washington's books and work and not just use medical apartheid, but actually understand what she means. Um, and, I, and then there's a couple of groups. I think there's a Black Women in Public Health group on Facebook. There's a Black Men in Public Health um, Facebook group that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. so there, there are these networks of folks who, who do this work from different vantage points, but um, are, are, uh, are organized around, around these, these issues. Thank you. So I want to thank you, Kenyon, for sharing your expertise with us. I know we uh, did not even get into the full breadth of all the things that mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about and what you know, but you certainly gave us so much to think about and to better understand. Um, I also want to conclude by thanking uh, Data and Society once again, CJ, Rigo, Rona, Audrey, and Kelly um, for helping organize this and uh, for participating in it. And I want to thank all of the viewers also for uh, checking us out. Um, please check out the resource, uh, the resource guide. And I believe this is being recorded. So for those who want to share this as an educational tool, uh, that was a big part of why we wanted to uh, kind of have this conversation. Um, and so thank you uh, if you do share it with others. All right, everyone. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. So